Well, it's always a, a privilege to be able to preach on Sunday morning. You know, one of the things people always ask me, honestly, I get uh, asked quite frequently, you know, are you, you know, does Pastor Cobb have any plans uh, to retire, you know, and are you going to take over the church? And my answer is always the same. Pastor Cobb's never discussed retirement with me or taking over the church. I love that about Pastor Cobb. You know, he's 81, 82, and I think he's just getting started. And so for me, it's always a privilege to be able to get up here and preach the Word of God on Sunday morning because, uh, you know, that's one of the things that's, that's encouraging is his leadership. He's very consistent, and he's always here uh, unless he, you know, this week, just like everybody, I mean, uh, at some point, you do need to take a break. He's on vacation with his family. He's over up on the north, uh, on east Texas with his brother and his wife. And I think they're going to be driving up to visit his sister-in-law. But So just pray for them. And uh, I appreciate you guys taking the time out of, out of your schedule to be here today so that you can listen to the Word of God. Because obviously, you know, not being the, the main pastor, you, you know, I remember growing up in church and any time the main pastor would say that he was going to be gone, then the turnout was always less. So, you know, I think one of the things that I'll do whenever I, I lead a church is I just won't tell people when I'm going to be gone. So that, that way, whoever's filling in for me, people will still show up. But if you'll turn your, your uh, Bibles over to Jude, if you'll turn your Bibles over to Jude, we're going to be focused on uh, a couple of verses. And the title of my message today is Heaven and Hell, A Soul Winner's Message. And what's interesting is this morning we were talking about just the basics just going back to the basic doctrines. And one of the things that's been laying on my heart lately, you know, and I think it's a message that needs to be preached to us, is just getting back to the main thing. And, uh, you know, it's so funny, but heaven and hell seem something so trivial to us, right, that are believers. We understand there's a heaven. We understand there's a hell. But the reality is, I don't know that we talk enough about it and the consequences or the rewards that come with it. And so today we're just going to focus a little bit. I'm going to keep it real short and simple and to the point. But if you'll turn over to Jude, let's just take a look at what the Bible says about these subjects and then how we tie it to leading others to Christ and, you know, just being out there so winners for the Lord. And so let's look at Jude uh, 1, verses 3 through 7, and it says, uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the com of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitations, have reserved. he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner give themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an ex for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The reason I chose those three, those set of verses is because in there we see that uh, the book of Jude is talking about heaven and hell. You know, it makes the reference in verse 6 to, and the angels which kept not their first estate. Well, what's their first estate? Heaven. You know, but left their own habitations. He had reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of of the great day and he's talking about hell right and then if we see there at the end it says even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about in like manner given themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set for for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire you know heaven and hell are real and the challenge that that we run into is sometimes I don't think that we make it real for others and so there's no fear of the consequences of what the choices that we make in this life there's going to be some serious eternal consequences for those who don't accept Jesus Christ. You know, so the first thing that we want to look at is there is a heaven. I know this is a very simple message. You're like, well, Pastor, why would you preach something like this? Well, you know, it might be simple to us, but it's something that we need to reinforce not only in our lives, but in the lives of others. You know, this week uh, when I was down there uh, in, in McAllen, Texas on business, one of the groups that we work with, uh, they... Uh, the doctors at Seventh-day Adventist and his mother passed away. 
And so one of my friends or acquaintances that I know went to the funeral, and he was talking about how the pastor or the, because uh, they're not, you know, obviously for me, a pastor is those that preach the word of God, but they were using scripture about sleep and how there is no such thing as when you're absent in the body, you're present with the Lord. And then when you're sleeping, the body sleeps, and that's how you prove that Jesus, you know, that God made sleep for the dead, and that, you know, you're not going to go into heaven until he wakes you up. Well, the Bible says different, and I'm not going to go into that, but what I'm trying to say is that if we don't understand the basics, I guess they forgot to read 1 Corinthians 15, you know, and I guess they forgot to read in Hebrews where God says he's not the God of the dead, but of the living, of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. You know, they forgot all this scripture that talks about eternal uh, security and how the saints are in heaven with Christ already. And so there's no way that that could happen if the Bible makes reference to the saints in heaven all the time. So, but let's look at what, what the Bible says about heaven. Well, there is a heaven. We know that. But let's just, let's just reinforce that. And if you guys can turn to Acts 7 for my second point, but go to Acts 7. But we're going to look at Matthew 5.48. I'll just read that for you. It says, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is, in, which is in heaven, is perfect. So God the Father resides there. We know God is in heaven. And you think, well, that's a really basic statement. But you'd be surprised what people think heaven is. You know, I've heard people, you know, if you run into Jehovah's Witness and you ask them if they're going to go to heaven, they're like, well, we're already in heaven. God just have a, hasn't destroyed all the, the evil people. Well, the Bible is very specific. There's heaven and it's not here. You know, it, uh, Matthew 6, uh, 9 through 10 says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So what's interesting is God's telling us to pray to our Father in heaven and that our will should be done here on earth as it is in heaven. So we know that God, resi God the Father resides in heaven, but we also know that Jesus resides in heaven. See, one of the things that false doctors will do is, for example, and I, I am picking on the Seventh-day Adventists this week uh, because I dealt a lot with them, is, you know, one of the doctors that they teach is that in 1844 or the mid-1800s, you know, when Jesus didn't come back and they misread the Bible according to their prophet, what happened was it wasn't that he was coming back, is that he was moving into the right hand of God. And then he was going to start the investigative judgment. I'm not going to go into that. But the Bible is very specific that that's not true. And we see, when you can prove the lies of a false doctrine, then you can lead people to Christ. You know, we have to be, uh, we have to speak truth. But the only truth we should be speaking is biblical truth. So turn to Acts 7, verse 55, says, and this is after Stephen had preached to the Pharisees. They're about to stone Stephen. And Stephen dies a martyr for the cause of Christ. And in Acts 7, verse 55, says, but, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So this happened way before 1844. And we see that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God in heaven. It says, and, and, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. So we see that Jesus is in heaven. And you'd be like, well, why, why even mention all this? Well, apparently, this day and age, this is something that needs to be mentioned quite frequently. These are subjects that you're going to run into when you're out soul winning. And then the final thing that I want to point out about you know, knowing that there is a heaven is go to Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17 says that we that are saved will go to heaven. Now, there's a whole, honestly, each one of these subjects requires its own uh, sermon, but for the sake of filling in for Pastor Cobb, you know, I, I broke it down into a so many message. But the Bible tells us in Matthew five seventeen, it says, "Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled." Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and, so, and shall teach me, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is talking about salvation, right? How do you exceed this, uh, the righteousness of a false prophet? Well, you're justified or you're made righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. And once you've done that, when we die in the physical body, we won't experience the second death. Those who were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, right? Lake of fire that burns with uh, fire and brimstone. And so the thing that we know is that when we pass, our soul, our spirit immediately goes to heaven. So there is a heaven, and we are going to reside there for some time. Now, we can, I, I'm not going to get into that, but the Bible does speak of the new heaven and the new earth and the fire destroying earth, and you know, he, he sets up his new kingdom. But we will be in heaven for a time, right? That's a fact. And the fact that heaven exists means that we should be preaching about heaven. And go to John, uh, well, you don't, don't, don't go to John. Um, go to Luke 12, but I'll read this for you. John 14, 6, you all know the verse. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, how do we get to the Father? If the Father is in heaven, and Jesus is the way to the Father, well, then that's how we're going to get there. Right? He's in heaven, and we're going to get to the Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is a heaven, and that brings me to the next point. Because there is a heaven, that's the nice one to talk about. We know that there also is a hell. And you'd be surprised how many people don't believe in hell. As a matter of fact, uh, just this morning I was preparing for the sermon this afternoon, but I'll tell you anyways. You know, one of the things that Seventh-day Adventists believe is that, that it's such a contradictory statement. You know, I was reading a sermon uh, about the, the, the subject that a sermon from a Seventh-day Adventist church or a pastor and one of the things that he was saying of it, it, it applies to this message today is it, it, in there it says that God when he uh, condemns you to hell the everlasting fire will consume you and then the fire goes out because it's no longer needed so you know they believe in, in a thing called annihilism which means that once you're uh, condemned to hell God's going to burn you up and I guess you're just going to disappear, and then that's the consequence. Well, the Bible tells us different. It's very specific that it's an eternal damnation, and it's an eternal torture for all eternity. As a matter of fact, a lot of false religions will preach and teach that the, the story of Lazarus and the rich man is a parable, which we know it's not. God's very specific when he's talking in parables. You know, Jesus is very specific when he's talking parables. But let's go there uh, to Matthew. Go to Luke in the meantime, and I'll tell you. So hell is not meant for us. Matthew 25, 41 tells us that. It says, Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So we know that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels when they left their first estate. The challenge is that once we... You know, the, Adam sinned first, and now we continue in that sin nature. Well, hell also applies to us because God can't be surrounded by sin, right? It says, for, for, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reason we come short of the glory of God is because sin separates us from God, right? So, do we deserve to go to hell? Absolutely. If you're not saved, the Bible says you're already condemned. Go to Luke 12. Let's look at what the Bible says. Don't, don't just take my word for it. Luke 12, 4 says, And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he killeth hath power to cast you into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. A couple of things that, that you need to, that, to point out here. Matthew 10, 28 says the same thing. It's a parallel passage. It says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both uh, uh, soul and body in hell. A couple of things. False religions will preach two things that, that, that stand out here. Number one, you know, I grew up listening to this verse. And this verse, uh, they made reference to that that was Satan. Well, Satan can't destroy your soul. He's a created being just like we are. That's number one. And number two is, if you go to Luke 12, 5, it says, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killeth hath power to cast into hell. You know, people say, well, you know, when you reject God, what you're doing is you're casting yourself into hell. 
Right? If you don't accept Jesus Christ, what you're doing is you're choosing hell. No, you're not. You're, you're choosing to reject Christ. But God's the one that's casting you into hell. See, we got, we got to stop playing this game that somehow we can control what we do with our salvation. That somehow we have the power to tell God how and when and at what time things should occur for our eternal security. The Bible is very clear that once you're saved, you're always saved. That if you believe on Jesus Christ, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And that's it. It's not a work salvation. The Bible is very clear. If it was works, then there wouldn't be one to fear that can take the body and the soul. Right? Then we would be able to trust man, or we would be able to trust uh, angels or principalities to tell us what it is in the law that could save us. And so we have to then go out there and tell people, look, we deserve hell. And people don't like to hear that. Well, I don't know if I can worship a God that says his love, but will cast you into hell. Well, that's what the Bible says. I mean, I'm just the messenger. And I'm preaching the message of truth. And you would want me to preach the message of truth because you don't want to be going to hell. And you don't want your brothers and sisters, your family members, your friends to go to hell. See, what stood out to me was I had a, a discussion with a close family member of mine. And I, I don't want to call him out here, uh, you know, because we do post these on YouTube and stuff. But a close family member of mine, he knows who he is, if he ever listens to this, that believes that you can lose your salvation. And that believes that when you go to hell, it's an annihilism. That there is no consequence eternally for your sin. See, when you're annihilated, then that's it. It's over. But see, God says that when you're cast into an eternal fire, an eternal hell, and that you're going to suffer consciously for all eternity. So when there is, when we talk about heaven, we better be talking about hell. You know, the Bible tells us in John uh, 3.18, this really stands out to me. He says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. I, I, you know, we, you always hear sermons and it's always like John 3.16. You know, we know that one, right? And then 17, that Jesus came not to condemn. Then we forget 18. But I love 18 and we're going to go 18 through 21 this time. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. See, how do, you remo- how do you remove condemnation from your life? You believe on Him. Who's that Him that's talking about? Well, if you go back to 17 and 16, it's Jesus Christ. It says, but he that believeth not is condemned already. See, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're condemned already. Well, what are you condemned to? Well, we just told you it's hell, right? Uh, let's go, uh, let's keep reading there on verse 18. It says, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Well, we know the only begotten Son of God is Jesus Christ. It says, And that this condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth... And I like this word that I highlighted here in my, in my sermon. He says, But he that doeth not good works, not good things, not feed the poor. It says, he that doeth truth. See, what truth is it we're going to be doing? Biblical truth. See, when we're reading the word of God, we're only going to focus on his truth. It says, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. And the reason that I focus on that is because one of the reasons that, you know, I love Pastor Cobb is that Pastor Cobb preaches truth. And when you preach truth, truth is very offensive. It can come off hateful. It can come off wrong. But you know what? Whenever your, your core is, sh- is uh, shook like that, whenever you're shaken to the core, that's the only way that you have that conviction to really seek out the truth that can lead you to everlasting life. Right? I remember when I got in a car, and you know, Trey's back there, so he knows who, who I'm talking about. Trey was my business partner, uh, and still is on, on certain other things. But Trey and I go uh, you know, about 20 years back, maybe 17 but I remember I got in a car with our business mentor at the time, and I was 20, 21, and I guess he had found out that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. And people said, well, you shouldn't talk mean about other religions, and you shouldn't say certain things, and you shouldn't, be, uh, you know, you shouldn't approach it a certain way. So I got in the car, and he says, hey, I heard you're, you're a Seventh-day Adventist. I said, yeah, that's true. He says, you know that that's a satanic cult, and you're going to hell. I mean, that's pretty offensive. 
And when you're 21 and you don't know much, I mean, I didn't know what to say at the time. But one thing that it did do is that it made me think, why would someone tell me something like that? And then I, I went and searched out the scripture. See, when you go about it the opposite way, without truth, when you skirt around the issues, what you're doing is you're only jeopardizing those that you're trying to lead to Christ. Right? You know, if somebody has cancer, you don't want to tell them that that cough is a common cold. You want to tell them, hey, you have cancer. You're dying. You have six months to live, three months to live, maybe two years to live. You know why? Because it's, it's only right to tell them how they should prepare for their physical death, right? And if you found out that a doctor didn't tell somebody that they had cancer, you'd probably think like, well, that's malpractice. You know, that guy should probably be, you know, have his license removed or even to the point of t sending him to jail for false information, right? Well, that's the same thing with us when we're not preaching the entire truth, the entire counsel of God is we should be removed from our ministry if we're not telling people the truth the entire truth. You know, it says His Word is truth. Thy Word is truth. Whose Word? Jesus Christ. So, if we're going to preach to others, if we're going to have a soul winning heart, we better believe that there's a heaven and we better believe there's a hell. You say, well, you know, did you really just... It almost sounds like you put this together so you didn't have to preach anything hard. No, actually, I put this together because it's amazing how many people you run into that don't believe that there's a heaven and that there's a hell. And us as Baptists, us as fundamentals, should have the fundamentals down. We should believe that God said there's a heaven and God said there's a hell and that there's a consequence to both of them, right? If we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we can dwell with the Lord forever. But if we reject Jesus, He's going to cast us into the lake of fire. Because we sought, we because we didn't do truth. It says, "But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in him." So, hell was not meant for us. We deserve to go to hell, but we should not wish hell on the lost. We should only wish it on those who hate God. You know, there is a doctrine that we preach, the reprobate doctrine. It's those that. They, they've come to the point where they've rejected Christ so much they now hate Him. You know, but I'm not going to go into that in Romans 1. And there's no more opportunity for them. God's given them up. But because of that, sometimes we take a, a, that attitude towards the entire world. But God says, look, there's a lost world and the laborers are few. The harvest is ready, but the laborers are few, right? The harvest is white. Let's go to, uh, there to 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9, and I, I got them right here. Uh, the Bible tells us, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth shall also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. See, God's going to burn up all the works because the only way into heaven is the fruit of the Spirit and it's through Jesus Christ, right? But it's say, but the big thing I want to focus on is God's telling us, look, you should have a soul in his heart because he's not willing that any should perish. Now, some will perish and the Bible tells us that it's broad, right? The road. There's a lot that will perish, but it's not for us to decide or to be complacent about the thing. It's for us to decide to go out there and do the work of the Lord because it says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night. See, we don't know when the Lord is coming. We have signs and we have certain things that He's going to prepare us for, so I believe that He's not coming tomorrow because biblically, all the things that He says are going to come to haven't. But we don't know when He's coming. The other thing, though, forget just the day of the Lord. We don't know not only when He's not coming, but we also don't know when people are going to die. And see, sometimes the Lord stirs the heart for you to preach the Word to somebody else, and maybe you're embarrassed, or you don't want to bother them, or you don't want to impose. But you don't know if that's the last time that you're going to have an opportunity to tell somebody about heaven and hell. See, you've got to... I mean... If, if you're not lamenting the souls that are lost, then where, where is your soul in his heart? Where is your doctrine? See, because if, if you know, if you study the Word, and you know there's a heaven, and you know there's a hell, and you know that that hell's real, man, it becomes more apparent every time that you're talking to somebody, right? And you want to go out there and tell others of Jesus Christ. 
you know, when I, when I hear of these close family members of mine that don't believe, it makes me sad. Think about your family members. Because the minute that they pass, it's eternity in hell forever. Forever. That, those individuals that we know that have passed that weren't saved, whether it's a day or a week or a month or a year or 50 years, it doesn't matter. It's not going to stop. And they've been there in hell for that long. You know, just burning in hell for all that time and forevermore. That's a serious consequence if we're not out there teaching the basic principles. You know, so the Bible tells us that there's a heaven and that there's a hell. And I know you're like, wow, that, there you go again with that. But it's that simple. Sometimes we complicate this issue too much. I mean, seriously, just talk to Jehovah's Witness for any amount of time and they don't believe in heaven. They don't believe that there's a heaven. They think that only 144,000 will hang out out there because they read some verse out of context and that everybody else is walking around here and we're all in heaven. Man, I hope this is not heaven because the Bible says there's going to be no more suffering, no more, no more tears. We're going to have joy. Let me tell you, sometimes I shed tears. Sometimes there's suffering in our lives. Sometimes things are hard. You know, just, just a couple of days ago or about a week or two ago, I was in excruciating pain because... I had a back spasm. That was not, that didn't sound like the heaven of the Bible. Let me tell you, that was not fun. So I'm just telling you that that's a lie from the pit of hell. That's a lie that will send millions, not thousands, millions of people to hell. Because Jehovah's Witnesses is one of the largest religions here in the United States. They have like 8 to 20, they can't make up their mind, but according to the records, it's 8 million. But the reality is probably more closer. 16 million people going to hell. All because they think they're already living heaven on earth. When the Bible tells us very differently. So, you know, what is it that, what's the point of this message? Well, the message is, you know, soul winning keeps you ready, uh, battle ready, in the fight and shooting for heavenly rewards. See, the reason I preach is, we want to preach on heaven and hell because we want to have a soul winner's heart. We want to tell others of Jesus Christ. And really the reason, why do we tell others of Jesus Christ? Because we're telling them of the two main things, right? You're trying to avoid hell so that you can be in heaven with Christ for all eternity. And, you know, we can get into all the deep doctrine of how, you know, the millennial reign and all that stuff. But that's not the point. We can learn that later. The simplicity of salvation is what we should be preaching. And it, could, and it comes down to two very simple things. Look, Jesus died on the cross. Or a couple of th things. But Jesus died on the cross for us, right? He paid for our sins so that we would avoid hell and we could be in heaven forever. You know, turn to Jude 1, verse 17. Go back to Jude. And then we're going to be in Ephesians 6. So Jude, and then put your finger there in Ephesians 6. You know, the Bible tells us that we need to be battle ready. The Bible tells us we're in a battle for the souls of men and women. Right? For humanity. He doesn't want... He, what did he say? He says he's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long-suffering to us word not willing that any should perish that any that means all have a chance some have rejected them openly and vehemently but everybody has a chance until they don't right the bible tells us there in Jude 1 17 says but beloved remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our lord jesus christ how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own God, ungodly lusts, these be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit, but, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. The Bible likens the soul winning heart to us literally saving people out of the eternal fire. Because of the, saving others saved with fear. See, some people say, well, I got saved because I feared hell. Good. That's how you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because then you believe that there is a hell. Right? But you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to avoid hell. That's fine. 
wait all day long. Now, grow in Christ, that's a whole other sermon and a whole other time, but hey, I'm all for that. Don't go there. Don't go there for all eternity. I was in, in a, a, real quick before we, we get to the next point, I was in a lot of pain about two weeks ago, and I couldn't walk. I had to get a cortisone shot, and I mean, it was excruciating pain. But it, was in, it came in waves, right? You know, like if I moved a certain direction, it would, it would, all my entire back would hurt and I would scream. I mean, literally I was screaming in pain. But the Bible says that hell is eternal pain and anguish. Meaning, you're, you're not going to be thinking about anything else but that pain. See, when I was, uh, when I had those waves of rest, I was making phone calls. I was working because I mean I can't stop working, right? I was talking to people, and then as long as I didn't cough or sneeze, do anything too crazy, I, I could handle the pain. So my brain was functioning in other things. I was thinking, how am I going to get past this? You know, now I got to drive back. I was doing other things in my mind besides just the pain. But the Bible talks about when you're being pulled out of the fires because you're not going to think about anything but that fire. You're not going to think about anything but that pain. You're going to be conscious in that eternal flame forever. I mean, so it's something that we really need to be conscious about and it's going to keep us battle ready because the challenge is we get complacent if we're not uh, reviewing the basics. See, you don't have a soul winner's heart if you're not reading your Bible every day. See, if you read your Bible all the time, you're going to know that there's a heaven and a hell and that there's consequences for that. If you're praying every day, if you're in church every week, if you're in church Wednesday and Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon, guess what? You're reminded of the cruel fact that you're condemned already and that there's only one way into heaven and that's through Jesus Christ. You know, it also keeps us in the fight. See, if, you're all, if, you're, if you know the basics, if you understand this, then it keeps you in the fight. Go to Ephesians 6.10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, if, if you're not willing to be in the fight, you're never going to put on the armor, right? And you don't want to be hanging around with some guy who's not willing to get in a fight with you, I mean, or be in the trenches with you. The Bible says, but you've got to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, once you're saved and you're out there soul well, the devil's still attacking. Because he's going to try to impede you from getting the gospel out to others. It says in verse 12, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, in other words, stop being warmongers. You know, I, I've never met a, you know, our country is, is uh, supposedly a bunch of Christians that just want to go and kill everybody. We want to be at war with everybody. And the Bible says that God's not willing that any should perish. But man, we're willing that everybody should perish. But it says that for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take, you, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having, all, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. In other words, you're doing truth, just like what we talked about earlier. Um, go to verse... Uh, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, verse 15... And your feed shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, that's why we go door knocking, right? Because your feet is what gets you door to door. And you, you're prepared with the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that then I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So what are we doing when we put on the whole armor of God? We're in the fight. And see, if you're in a fight, you're either going to be bold in that fight or you're going to cower, right? I mean... I, I know people that, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not one that, look at me, I'm five foot, you know, six, and I weigh 120 pounds of lead or whatever, so it's not like, I mean, I'm a big threat, but the one thing that, you know, that, that God gives you is the fight, to know that no matter what, you're going to be in that fight. See, I'm not afraid of the battle. I know I probably, you know, physically, I probably lose most battles, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to go down swinging, but that's what God wants us to do spiritually. He says, look, you're going to go down swinging. 
then go down swinging with the word of God. And guess what? We know we're going to be victorious. See, it's not our duty to choose what message we're going to preach. It's not our duty to complicate things because the Bible says that it's a simple message, right? Believe is not something that's difficult to understand. And prophecy might be difficult, but believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is pretty simple. And it's not our duty to go around thinking what fights we need to pick or what fights we shouldn't pick. All we got to do is do the truth. Like that verse said, right? All we got to do is preach the truth. Don't worry, the fights will come to us. But we've got to be battle ready. And we've got to be willing to be in the fight. And then the other thing that it does for us is that it teaches us what rewards we're looking for. The Bible says in Matthew 6, turn to Matthew 6, and then we're going to be in Colossians, and we'll close out. Matthew 6, 19. Matthew 6, 19. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We all need jobs or a business, something that puts food on the table. So the Bible speaks to that. And it says if you do anything, do it with all your will and your might and your soul. But that shouldn't be our driving force. You know, if, if you're always constantly looking for the next best house or the next best salary or the promotion, you're not going to be laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. The only treasures that are worth laying up are the treasures that God's asked us to, to lay up. The crowns of life, you know, the soul winner's crown, the crowns of tribulation, all of that. And the rewards and the things that, you know, he's building mansions for us in heaven we should be just looking forward to that mansion maybe you're not going to have a mansion here on earth but god's already jesus said that he went to prepare mansions for us right what are we doing to earn those how many people are we talking to about christ how many people are we soul winning to how often are we preaching the gospel of jesus christ go to colossians 3 1 and we'll close out with this it says if ye be then risen with christ Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Colossians 3 1. Colossians 3 1. Verse 2. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So the Bible is telling us to not set our affections on things of this earth but things above see when you're preaching the message of Jesus Christ it removes that wanting for the things of the world now we're human we're sinners we have you know weaknesses and so every once in a while you're gonna fall into that trap the devil is very wily it says he's gonna beguile you with his fiery darts but we've got to put on that whole armor so that we can go out there and do the will of God so we can go out there and win souls to Christ. So we can go out there and preach the word. And we can fight those battles. See, the battles are going to come. Once you're saved, you're no longer on the devil's team. right? But the challenge is, the devil's not worried about those that have their affection set on things of this earth. Where they're laying up treasures here. Where they're buying the next yacht. Or the next boat. Or the next ret they're looking to the next retirement. Or the next best job. Or they're keeping up with the Joneses. He didn't care about that. But he does care about those that have their affection set above. They're looking to the day of the coming of the Lord. They're looking to that eternal, perpetual peace, that day of rest. And so, bottom line is, we've got to know what our foundation is. And we've got to know what others are doing to get you off that track. Because if you talk to any good Seventh-day Adventist, and I mean, today's the Seventh-day Adventist, tomorrow's the Mormons, you know what? Just call them out, right? The Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, all of them, they're sending people to hell. All of them are sending people to hell. See, we don't believe in all religions. As a matter of fact, the Bible speaks of pure religion. And it's to take care of the fatherless and the widows, right? And to keep yourself unspotted from the world. See, the thing that we need to worry about is the truth of Christ. Because there's groups out there that preach a different gospel. There's people out there that will come to you 
and teach different things. And if we're not grounded in the Word of Christ, we won't be able to go out there and so many. Going back to the point I was making about the Seventh-day Adventists, you talk to them and you ask, what's the difference between a Seventh-day Adventist and a Baptist? Oh, well, we're just the same. We just go on Saturday. That's what they say. That's exactly, I mean, they're trained to say that. As a matter of fact, I know they're trained to say that because I used to say that. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making this stuff up. Like, I was a, a, I was a partaker of their lie. You know what I mean? So I know these things are true, but here's the challenge. Then what happens is then you leave the issue alone. See, if you don't understand the truth, you're going to leave it alone because you're like, well, whatever. Don't ever assume that because somebody sounds like they have the right doctrine that they're saved. You know, I was talking to that individual, that family member, and he's like, look, I don't like talking to you. I mean, he actually got in a fight with me. And, and it's okay. It was an argument. But, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't engage because I didn't want to leave that bad mouth in his, uh, in, in it, that, that taste in his mouth. But the argument was, you know, he said, look, I'm saved. I know you're always trying to get me saved because what I told him was, look, I said, if you'll just take 10 minutes to watch this video. There's videos out there that are, that are the biblical way to heaven from other pastors, you know, throughout the country. And I said, look, I know you're not going to listen to me. And I know that, that you know me, so it's a kind of the difficult thing. But if you'll just listen to this video, you know, I just want to make sure you get this thing of salvation right. He's like, no, I'm saved. I said, well, look, if you're saved, then, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to push any buttons. I mean, if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, yeah, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is great. And then the next question I asked him, I said, so do you think you can lose your salvation? Well, yeah, of course. Then you're not saved. The Bible says once saved, always saved, right? It's an eternal security. The Bible tells us in John 10, go turn there and we'll close out with that. You know, we use this a lot in the soul winning. These are probably my favorite salvation verses because these, this is what I read to understand that it was forever. Nobody actually ever technically taught me that. Like, I didn't, I don't remember hearing it from a pulpit. Uh, and then afterwards, I, I mean, I, we listen to it all the time, but I remember reading this and it just made so much sense. It says, in John 10, 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. See, I don't understand how difficult it is to just explain. Never means never, right? Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So you're in God, in Jesus' hand. It says, my Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father, and I and my Father are one. So the Bible tells us that it's an eternal security. We're going to be sinners no matter what. But once we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's forever. So how can we lose something that we can't... How, so my, my uh, family member... I almost gave it away, man. You know, just gotta, I didn't want to call him up, but I almost gave it away. But that family member... And then it's actually not just that family member. There's several family members in my... They, they think that they can unhinge the Father's hands and get themselves out of it every time they sin. That somehow they're stronger and better and more knowledgeable than Jesus Christ Almighty and that they can just go around and they're inside His hand and somehow they can just pluck that finger open and scurry on out. And then they're like, well, we figured it out. I'm sorry, Jesus. And then scurry right back in. The You're not going to do that. You know, I mean, I, again, I'm going to liken it. I'll close. You know, if my, if my son or my daughter, my daughter's two years old, if she's holding out in my hand, I don't care how much she struggles, she's not going to get rid of me. Maybe once she gets older and stronger, right? But right now, she's two years old. I don't care what she does. She's not, she's not going to get free of my hand. If I can hold my daughter's hand at that age, and I know for a fact that she, I'm not going to let go of that, imagine what Christ can do, being the all-powerful, almighty. So let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to preach uh, to the main congregation and uh, that Pastor Cobb would entrust me and uh, have enough uh, faith in, in me that I, he knows that I can preach the same gospel and that I'm not going to uh, stray from the truth. So I appreciate the opportunity to just be up here, Lord. Lord, help us to get back to the basics, to preaching about heaven and hell and uh, you know eternal damnation and condemnation and that Jesus is the way the truth and the life and that no man can come unto the Father but by Him Lord just help us to go out there and be soul winners and 
be ready for the battle and be in the fight and know that uh, if we can be prepared and we can be protected and that we can go out there and do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.